Welcome back to the Santita Jackson Show. We've been away for a while and we've been experiencing a lot of growth here at the Word Network and so we hope that you will love what we have to offer you from the Santita Jackson Show and from our friends and family here at the Word Network. You know, since I've been away, I've been meditating on one of my favorite Bible verses from the book of James, count it all joy, so that when you fall into various trials, you don't let them get you down. You let them achieve their work and perfect you. And boy, are we in a trial right now. As we go to Tate today, we are experiencing a government shutdown. And so it made us think, it made us wonder, what role does the church have in our lives today? At a time when we are experiencing poverty that we have not seen in 50 years, more than 46 million Americans are actually in poverty, not counting those who are near poverty. What role does the church have in our lives today? We thought about this church, or we heard about this church rather, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Actually, it's an aggregation of churches, 25 of them. They have more than 100 volunteers, and they've been feeding the homeless. And in these tough times, you've seen a 60% surge in homelessness in Harrisburg alone. Well, guess what? They were told that they could no longer feed the hungry. Wow, can you imagine? We have a lot of churches that tell us about abundance and they are prospering. But these churches that deal with the needs of the poor, well, they're being pulled back from the poor. Is that what Jesus would do? Let's talk about it on the Santita Jackson Show. Welcome back to the Santita Jackson Show. I'm so happy to be with you, and I want to meet you on social media. Yes, on Twitter, reach me on at Santita J, and on Facebook, the Santita Jackson and Friends page. Let's talk about this topic, the role of the church in our lives today. We're very excited to have a wonderful panel. Bishop Horace Sheffield of Brooklyn, New York, and Detroit from the New Destiny Christian Fellowship Church. Bishop Allison Abrams of the Zion Progress Baptist Church here in Detroit. So Howard glad you're here. Fellow Howardite. Love it, love it. Love it love Your it. daughter's there now. Yes, she is. That's right. <laughs> and of course, we've got one of uh, our country's foremost civil rights lawyers. Indeed, a great human rights figure in our country. What is your name? Linda. Attorney Linda <laughs> Bernard. Indeed, she's won several cases before the Michigan Supreme Court. We're so glad that you always join us. Thank you. Broken leg and all. Thank you. And of course, we've got one of the icons. She's been the producer of our show, and she's going to be leaving us very soon. But she's an on-air personality for PBS. She's based in Chicago. Author, journalist, great teacher, because in fact, she is a professor at the Columbia School, uh, Columbia College in Chicago. Uh -huh. This is my producer and dear friend, Sylvia Ewing. Thank you, so Thank kind. you. The role of the church in our lives today. Were you surprised when I brought up uh, what's happening in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? When I spoke with you last evening, Bishop Abrams, you were shocked by this story. Totally. Uh, that you have 25 churches that have come together, uh, yes. more than 100 volunteers, 60% surge in homelessness in Harrisburg, and now, They've been told that they can't feed these people anymore because many people in the community say, we don't want to see all of these poor people around. This is just a little bit much. You're in the heart of Detroit. Right, right. And, and first and foremost, as a church, we've been charged to feed the hungry. And so uh, I believe that these churches had come together to do one of the missions of the church, uh, which is to take care of the least of these, and to be told by... Um, I don't know if it was ordinance or just by the community that they could no longer feed the people. I think it is, um, it is a terrible thing because if the church doesn't do it, if the people of God don't do it, who's going to do it? Obviously, the community uh, organizations weren't doing it because if so, uh, the church wouldn't have had to been doing that. I believe it said for the last seven years, six or seven yeah, years. Absolutely. And so um, I believe also it stated that some people were complaining about uh, some of the people coming over into another area. Well, um, I, I just believe that, you know, when you have a group that has a need, and mm -hmm. obviously it was a large need, the reason they had to take a whole parking lot. And so, Wait a minute, uh, and 25 churches, right? <laughs> 100 volunteers. Well, let me go to Bishop Sheffield, mm -hmm. because you are in two cities. Mm -hmm. You are in Detroit, you are in mighty, mighty Brooklyn, mm -hmm. 
And what are you seeing? I mean, in, in New York City, the, uh, the rate of unemployment for African-American men is about 50 percent. Well, first of all, I think churches should be commended. We live in an era of self-absorption. Most churches are struggling just to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Many of them are in foreclosure. And, and uh, ties, offerings are down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then you contrast it with a friend of mine, for example, I preach for who spends $2,000 a week on fresh flowers. Um, you know, the, the church is in chaos. And so to have congregations that look beyond themselves and take seriously the condemnation that Amos spoke against those uh, who were stepping over the poor to go in to, uh, uh, to perform their priestly functions mm -hmm. is to be commended. Because yes. even though Christ thought of others, most of our churches are consumed with themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part about that is, is that, you know, people don't like, even when they're engaged in this kind of ministry, having those folks around their own churches. Uh, Ardu, Sheard, um, Ardu Smith, by the way, has done a piece on churches that serve the poor, say that many of these congregations will feed them during the week, but don't want them there on Sunday. Yes. Right. So, I mean, it's not... Well, well explain that. Well, it's, it, well, it's a twofold. One is many of the people who are served by these churches don't like the stigma of being poor, so they don't like to go where they've been fed. They like to go somewhere there's some anonymity. But also there are many people who serve the poor but still have certain you know, uh, feelings about these folks that don't want them to necessarily worship in their congregations. So I guess what I'm saying to you is it's a commendable thing that there was an aggregation of congregations that really helped the poor, mm -hmm. and that this is really at the core of who this nation is. I mean, this nation was not founded by wealthy people, but people who were dispossessed, people who were alienated and treated differently by virtue of their religious uh, faiths. Well, I mean, how does a city make a move on churches? I mean, now you understand this from the legal angle. I mean, clearly it's legal, but Slavery was legal at one time. It was legal for women not to vote. I mean, we, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King tells us that we should oppose that which laws that are unjust. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, do, do the homeless, could the homeless sue the city? I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> really, uh, 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 I hadn't thought about that. They, they, they can't, but, but churches now are. They can or they cannot? They, they can't. Okay. They are ecclesiastical corporations and they operate like corporations. I mean, they have funding, and of course, a lot of their funding now to do these sorts of programs is public funding. They get neighborhood opportunity fund grants, they get public grants, they get federal grants in order to carry on this ministry because it's expensive. In some instances, they get major donations of food and so forth, but it generally, they're paying for it out of their own pocket. But I think what you really are seeing is, is what's happening in America, i.e., the, the 1% uh, which controls all the wealth in America, about 85% of the wealth, objects to seeing those that are less fortunate. But we've so. seen a greater concentration of wealth. This story came out this week. Mm -hmm. In the top 1%, we haven't seen this kind of concentration of world wealth correct. since 1916. That's correct. I mean, this is like, yeah. so. this is stunning. And so when I see, what well, you have people who were middle class who are now becoming poor. Yeah, poor. Yeah, I yeah. mean, and uh, let me and shift and this to, well, yeah. yes, Bishop. Well, say, this yeah. this is really what ought to scare, uh, you know, the folks who are in Congress who are shutting the nation down. As we it's, take. It's one thing for yes. someone mm -hmm. never to have had. It's another to have had and lost. Right, right. And so we're looking at people who lived in nice homes, who had regular jobs, who had health insurance, who are not used to that sense of desperation. Uh, and it's a whole different kind of scenario, uh, not only in New York where I pass, but also here in Detroit. I have a, a significant number of people in my church who worked in the auto factories, some of whom took taking bailouts, and I'm sure Linda and, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Abrams would tell you, many of those people got huge sums of money, which they thought was enough money to carry them over. I broke, I homeless. Uh, and having gotten $100,000 five years ago. So I'm just saying is this is not a cat that's going back in the box. These are not people who anesthetize themselves and are satisfied with being discontent. Wait, you say this is not a cat that's going back in the box. <laughs> no, but I mean, they uh, hide the box, though. That's part that's of correct. what's going yeah, But they're not going to be able because these are not, you know, black people or poor folks or folks who are illiterate, who didn't prepare themselves, who didn't make the right what, moves. people who deserve These are folks dirt. who have been put out of the American <laughs> society, mainstream economic life because of decisions of the 1% who right. are in these corporate positions who've made dismal 
uh, mistakes that have affected the livelihoods of all of us. So when you hear a lot of people, as I come to you, when you hear a lot of people say that this is a personal problem, you know, because we're hearing from certain quarters, and I can't just say it's from the so-called right wing, you hear it, you hear it in church even, that, uh, that a lot of people are poor because they're not working hard enough, you can always find a job. And, Let's say that narrative. And, to see, and, you, and you tell these stories on public radio, which is where I met you, on public television. Mm -hmm. You're a journalist. You see this. But the narrative can't be sustained when, as um, Pastor Sheffield says, it's happening to the middle class. It's happening to people who didn't expect to be in dire straits. And circling back to the Harrisburg story, this is a matter of optics. One of the major problems in this country is we care more often about perception than reality. Mm -hmm. And you can hide all these poor folks and not feed them in your parking lot. The fact is they're still poor and we still have to deal with it as a country. And whenever people are inconvenienced by having to look upon those who are in need, that is a challenge for certain parts of our society. And for us to move forward as a, a country and with the church playing a strong role, mm -hmm. we have to truly see what is happening in order to fix it. If we hide it, try and sweep it under the rugs, we can't fix it. But see, this, this, this to me like, goes to a spiritual crisis. If it, I, I just yeah, want to okay. say, as yes. the church, I think this is, once again, there is an alarm sounding that we need to raise our voices and begin to gather the persons in the community. Because when you have, uh, back to the uh, Harrisburg uh, situation, when you have something like that, the people in the community still should recognize they still have some degree of power. Mm -hmm. And so if all the people Even were if to you're get homeless. together, mm -hmm. well, the people who can go and vote, let me say that, because those who are able to go to the polls, those who are able to sign petitions, should gather themselves together and, uh, you know, sign petitions, send it to um, the elected officials office, to the county clerk, to the city office, whoever it was that gave the ordinance that they, they could not have that and raise their voices and let them know, hey, this is what we want. This is what the people want. And, and I think, you know, but, but, we're but, seeing but, that see, with many, many things, other things around the country today. Well, Our people Bishop, are not are not gathering themselves but they're and pushing not raising it. their voices. It's the people who are saying, don't do this. And see, let's not just talk about the church. Let's talk about us. We're the church. This, I mean, this is us. We okay. are saying, now let, let me just take that off the table. We are saying, I do not want to see these people in the middle of my city. That's absolutely they true. They make me uncomfortable. That's why you have jails and prisons. And, and, and they are going. going there and they're working That's for correct. corporations. There you That's go. Correct. And they're growing. The, the house that I live in, a great uh, documentary on PBS, mm -hmm. talks about this. Michelle mm -hmm. Alexander writes about this in The New Jim Crow. That's right. Spiritually, what does it say about us, Bishop Sheffield? When well, we I mean, I, I, I've talked about Amos, you know, that great uh, uh, prophet that's not uh, often preached about, but he was a herdsman and he was up in the mountains because mm -hmm. God couldn't find anybody to speak to the atrocities of the accumulation of wealth by churches and the poor coming to the temple seeking alms and the priests walking over them to go in to have church and leave them outside hungry. And so Amos came down and said, woe to them at ease and Zion. But listen, Here's where I'm at. You know, all of this is about how we organize society, what value we place on human life. And mm -hmm. I've been saying in Detroit on my radio and TV show that, that we ought to, you know, they're talking about the, the, um, the tea party. We ought to have a we party. But the, the message ought to be this. You've got to have an espresso it's party. Our, <laughs> this is our money spend it on us. Now, uh, I saw a special where over in, in the Middle East, uh, in parts where we occupy with our military, the ground commanders are going around rebuilding homes mm -hmm. and buying washing machines mm -hmm. and dryers and putting new roofs. You know, I mean, spending billions in Iraq and can't spend five dollars on Mac. I no, mean, no, can't, won't. They won't do it. Right. And you're absolutely right. You spoke to and alluded to it from the very beginning because this whole racial alger, pull yourself by up by your own bootstraps. You're responsible for yourself. That's hogwash. Uh, we have got to get ourselves to the feverish pitch that existed in the civil rights movement, That's right. the That's anti war right. movement. That's right. Power conceives nothing by, uh, except by the man, never will, never, uh, never has, never will. And I don't see people doing it. I think, I think people basically have been anesthetized. 
I think people have been taught that somehow or another they don't have the power to make this happen. Right, that's right. And the messages that we need to have from the pulpits that tell people that we're capable of doing this and organizing a pile of bricks into a cathedral right. is not happening. But, you know, I'm seeing a conflict here because I speak to you about what people can do legally. Right. It's like the homeless don't count. They don't count. In, and, in, in and, no, today. and just from a they spiritual. Count in the census. Yeah, but yeah, and, and from. A, and <laughs> That's really when just, they count, too. They count in the census. I, but I have to say, as someone who is striving toward becoming more like Christ, you know, because I would never say that I am. It's just hard for me to say that I'm Christian because I'm. I'm, that's, not, I'm that's a goal to me, to be like Jesus, right? The, How is it that we can sit here and tolerate? I mean, what is it in us that makes us feel that it's okay to say you've got, you can stop feeding someone? Particularly now, as we are taping, we have a government shutdown. They did sign, the president did sign an order to pay the, the people military. in the military. Yes. But everybody else that's is nervous. That's a priority. Doesn't that it's, show it's, priorities right there? Yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to but, do here? But, but people are suffering from the complexities of life. And, the, and there is no, um, if you will, war on poverty or emphasis on it's poor a war, people There's a anymore. war on people everywhere I mean, all around the world, but there's no war on poverty. Right. And, and the the when is the church going to say Obama something about and that? And the president Warriors. only talks about the middle class. I mean, that 40 million, 45 million people that are not even close to middle class, that are below the poverty level, and so forth mm -hmm. in America, they, they 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 have nothing other than food stamps, which of course are being uh, cut down uh, here in Michigan anyway. No, no the there country. was a national cut right. on food stamps. And wait a minute, in ten years, mm -hmm. twenty eight million more Americans will be without food stamps. Four to six million have been cut immediately. I mean, this is two point eight million. This roll, this ball it's is the rolling. Gap. It's fast. the gap. Yeah. It's the gap. And, and the middle class is not particularly charitable because they're concerned about what they have and about keeping it because they see the erosion but within their own ranks. they're disappearing. They see, are that's, disappearing. That's, that's my thing. Yes. You know, you're seeing, we're seeing churches mm -hmm. in foreclosure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bishop Abrams, Bishop Sheffield. You said, I know you're seeing a difference in the collection plates. I mean, the oh, teachers yeah. are, teachers, teachers, yes. teachers are, are losing yes. <laughs> their jobs. <laughs> Howard University. Yes. The capstone of black education. Mm -hmm. We're hearing that they might even close. They lost millions in funding. But there's yes. so much, there is money in the world. It's just how is it distributed? Right. Because mm, there were it. more millionaires during the Depression or made during the Depression mm -hmm. than yeah. in any other time. Well, so it's a matter of, yeah. you said anesthetize. Right. What are, where is our focus? Are we busy being distracted? by our entertainments yeah. to, to yeah. soothe our pain, mm -hmm. that's so much easier than focusing on what you called for, or standing or, up and yeah. working for the thing. Or working being for responsible change. ourselves. Yeah. Another, Start and with I, you. I keep that's right. mentioning Start Andrew with Smith, he's one of my professors in my doctor program, and he's a young guy, he's out of Morehouse, uh, the King Center there. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things he says is that, you know, when you look at what we've gained, it's always been because we've coerced or forced them to do it. They've never just woke up and said, we're going to free the slaves. We're going to, you know, we're going to let you vote. We're going to do all these things. Exactly. And so he says, Uncle, Uncle Sam is not in our family. And so <laughs> what we have to do is, you know, because as soon as we let the pressure off, everything that we gain is taken away. We've seen that in every successive movement that we've Voting been a part rights. of. Uh, the era of reoppression, which followed, you know, Reconstruction. Right. Kenneth Stamps' great book. You go on and on and on and on. So what he says, though, is, and it, getting back to the church, is that we've got to aggregate our assets. We've got to find a way to pool what we have. And, you know, spending $90,000 a month for a place to worship, to praise the Lord, which is basically breath. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, using those resources. If I had $90,000 a month for a mortgage in my church, I got 90 families I can give $1,000 a month to to make a major difference in their life. So that's what I'm saying. I don't know how we do it. Our problem, of course, is it can be the right what if we don't like the who. It never happens, you know. We don't, you know, we don't like Jesse Jackson. We don't like El Sharpton. We don't like Horace Sheffield. We don't like Linda Bernard. And at some point, we got to get past all of that, right? Yeah. Uh, we all, as you say, you're trying to be Christian. We're all following Jesus. I'm trying. I mean, those of us in Christian churches, why can't we have more unity? Why can't we pool our resources? Why can't we pledge our buildings and do what we need to do for ourselves? But is that what we really, 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 really want to do? No, what we really want to do is use God for our own personal agendas. Mm. I mean, you know, you, you'd be astounded 
uh, to find folks in the church who who are selfless. Come on now, you know I said when I was in between. We uh, can come over to the Catholic Church. You know I'm Catholic, yeah. so that's we take that vow of poverty. Our priests do, so it makes a big yeah. difference. <laughs> Catholic Church. I don't know if we're going to start there. That's true. You know, I'm, I'm that's guess, true. I, I guess property in Rome. Well, yeah. you know, what I'm getting to is the vaults is, of the Vatican. Well, Love you know what? The they can, oh, but, but feed the poor. I mean, <laughs> I just I see a spiritual crisis within each one of us. I read a wonderful expression uh, just yesterday: uh, "God is in us, and we are in God." When does that enter into the picture? No one, we tend not to be concerned about hunger until we are hungry. Mm -hmm. Everything is self-centered. Yeah. And, um, and you know what, look, I suffer from that too. You know, just when things hit you personally, you, have, you suddenly have skin in the game, you have a dog in the hunt. More and more people are becoming poor every day. And we're becoming poorer every day. I mean, the poverty pool is going like this. The wealth pool is getting sharper and sharper and smaller and smaller. What are we going to do? What are our obligations as people who believe in God, who believe that God is real? Really, I, I what, what are we supposed to do when a church, when, because it's not just one church. This is 25 churches who've been told you cannot feed these hungry people. We don't want, and the people have said, we don't want to see them here. What, I mean, what, what should the minister, let me say, because okay. like, what should, what, what would you say to your, if you were in Harrisburg, starting well, first, with well, you, first of all, I mean, civil yeah. disobedience is the linchpin of the civil rights movement. Henry David Thoreau and his, you know, essay, uh, and Walden Woods. I mean, when they're unjust laws, we're not bound to follow them. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine the optic that she mentioned? If they continue to do it and the police come and arrest them, I mean, you have to force the subject. Some you don't allow people who are ungodly and profane mm -hmm. uh, to preclude you from doing holy and charitable things. Is this profane not to feed I the think poor? it's profane to, to prevent people from feeding the hungry, absolutely. I, I guess I would say that um, good leadership uh, would say we're not gonna we're not gonna accept this we're gonna continue the mission continue the work continue what we know we've been mandated to do and so even if we have to pick it even we have to hold some signs you think that the church march, you think that ministers I think should all say of that? them yes and i think the ministerial leadership needs to say that uh, they should get in the pulpit on sunday yes and say that and get in the streets get everywhere they can and say we need everybody out here making sure that the city recognizes that this is something that's of importance to us this is something that we've been mandated to do. This is something we know we have to do. This is something that we cannot overlook because this is something that's needed by our people. The same people who put you in office, the same people who uh, voted are the ones who can, uh, you know, find somebody else to replace you if you don't, you know, change on this particular subject uh, that's meaningful and important to us, those who are in the churches and those who are in the community. Well, you know, I, we used to have, uh, you remember they used to raise up collections in church mm -hmm. for people who were struggling, people who Mission were poor. Mission and benevolence. That's well, that, that comes we from that early church. Missions. You know, But most of that's the folks in that church use that money. That's right. Discreetly, and and discreet, and, but discreetly, know, yeah. a family that was in need, you yeah. might have this fund, somebody who needs help with their burial, so, and, and happy occasions, someone who's going off to college, you know, someone who's starting uh, out in life and, and needs yeah. some support. That's the, the church that my grandma helped build, Shiloh yeah. Baptist Church in Pennsylvania has all of those things. But my mother is in her 70s, doesn't mind me saying it, and is exhausted w from her food pantry work because the food pantry has become a huge need. Like yes. a grocery yes. store. It is, yes. you know, they are lifting Lots of people use those. Bo giant boxes and this is what people need to get by. They would not eat without this. Yeah. And that is a critical part of the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you, you're right, calling on people to organize. Now, you have to do it in such a way so that you don't call the government down on you for advocacy. Well, you know, but this is, but this is <laughs> our know, government. But no, you but, still have right. that right. Yeah, but, biblical, but, yeah, that's biblical. Wait a minute, because it is, it is our government. That's not a legal threat that's to right. preach the gospel that's of right. Jesus that's Christ. Right. That's how you say it. Which is to feed the hungry. Now, yes. the real work is exactly. organizing all those folks yes. that you've been feeding that's right. to vote. 
Yes, exactly. And well, teaching them well, the fish, right? Well, well teaching them the fish, but mm -hmm. all of that. But I am, I keep going back, I'm drilling down on this because when we had less, we did much more for each other and for other people. And it seems to me that the more affluent we have become, the stingier we become. We've lost you know, our skills well, too well, for no, survival. But you know, well, but, well, you know, that's I, what I Reverend Otis. Well, I will say this: what? Reverend Otis Moss, yeah. Junior, yes. out of yes. Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. one of the icons of, of Black right Christendom word. of yeah. Christendom, mm -hmm. said that his fear is that African Americans are losing our genius for survival. Because we right. knew how to and get by. Well, and we knew how to make it. We knew how to come together. Yeah. So, you know, you were not, there were no hungry people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but now we're not yeah. bishops. The whole culture has changed. Correct. I grew up in Tabernacle Baptist Church. My grandparents were two of 11 founding members. Jesse J. McNeil, who graduated from Union in, in Columbia, would come to church meetings with a pad of folks he visited. And the whole church meeting would be what John Brown or Georgia Sheffield needed. And they would pray for each family, mm -hmm. decide what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And then the deacon said, Brother Pastor, is there any other church business we need to handle? And, and the deacon said, no, Brother Pastor, you've already taken care of all business, take care of us. Now, we're not in that kind of ethos anymore. Everybody's out for themselves. Yes, yes, Churches are based. Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. I'll be mm -hmm. done. I, I say I'm going to be done. I may not be done, but I'll try to be done. This. Look, <laughs> this, he, he, just think about what we say. The church needs... The church needs a thousand dollars to keep its lights on. I need a hundred and fifty to stay in my house, and we superimpose the needs of the church over the needs of the people, and then we wonder why the one place where we're supposed to forget about ourselves, where we're really self-absorbed, why nowhere else in our culture or in our community people have that kind of ethos we used to have hmm. that we do for each other, we put other folks first. Are you, are you following me? Yeah. We're following a man who died for us, never thought of himself, and yet we teach people in the church, you know, name it and claim it, you know, enlarge your land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you know, I mean, I got people in my church, <laughs> if God gave them what they asked for, it would take them away from church. You know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> so, so they I, got a car, they wouldn't drive it to church. But, but Bishop, that's what I mean. When we had, when we had less... We, we did. I mean, but, but we had spiritually. I felt. Right. I feel that we were larger. We were richer. We were selfless. But, but we can so have good. both. So, we but, were so selfless. I, I know that we can have say, both. But have my to, question uh, is, when did the shift occur, and how can we shift Integra things? The loss in, of integration. Well, law, when integration well, in when integration came, and we no longer had to depend solely upon ourselves, a whole lot changed. I think government change too and government regulations and so forth. In Detroit, what do we have? About 8,000 churches? There's a church almost no, on every corner. No, it's supposed to be like 30,000. 30,000, mm -hmm. excuse me. There's a church on almost every corner. Every, every block is beer, wine, lotto. There's a party store and there's a church. There are no other businesses, for the most part, nothing else of any, uh, of any significance. So you have more, if you will, quote, ministry. But I don't know if you have more... Ministering. Ministering <laughs> or, or, or true religion. <laughs> As I read this week, God is within us. God is with all of us. You know, there's a wonderful song, What If God Was One of Us? Just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. We have to really understand that God does not like what we're doing. God loves it when we love what he's created. God loves it when we treat each other as family. That is what we are. We are each other's brothers and sisters. Let's come together and act like that. Let's love one another. I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching this edition of the Santita Jackson Show. 